Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you turn with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter number 5. Luke chapter number 5, you can also uh, bring it up on your Uversion app. Go to the events tab. On the events, you'll see LHA Church listed, and you can pull up there, and you'll have the notes as well as the text for today. Luke chapter number 5 is where we're going. We've been, since the beginning of the year, we've been talking about building champions for the cause of Jesus Christ. This morning, is we're going to pick back up with that series and we're we'll going to continue with the challenge of looking today at the wonder of his forgiveness. The wonder of forgiveness is one of those things, friends, that you and I must come to an understanding of. For without it, we're going to find ourselves continually, continually living in defeat and spiritual discouragement. It is a truth that is so vital to your life. And it's a truth that is so vital to your spiritual understanding. Forgiveness is one of those foundational truths for our walk with Christ that without this truth, friends, we simply, we don't have the hope of heaven. We don't have hope beyond the grave. We don't have hope of eternity with Jesus. Without forgiveness of sin, there's no hope of being together with our loved ones for all eternity. But there is good news this morning. And the good news is this, though we have sinned and though from time to time we will again sin, how many of you found that there are times when you have to say, Lord, I'm sorry? <laughs> Amen. You know, I got saved a long time ago. There's been many times I've had to kneel my heart and my knee before him and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Sorry for my attitudes today. Sorry for my actions. Sorry my, for my thoughts. But the good news is, friends, we can call upon him today. And there's forgiveness in our lives. First John chapter 1 and verse 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sin and purify us. From all unrighteous. That's good news. How many of y'all like good news? Say amen. amen. Everybody likes good news. Nobody really cares for bad news except the news channels and the, uh, the commentators. They kind of like bad news because that's what keeps them in a job. But uh, somebody ought to design a good news news station. I'm telling you, it would go off the charts. Everybody want to hear good news. The truth is nobody ever comes up to you and says, hey, do you have any bad news for me? <laughs> Nobody wants any bad news. The truth is we live in a world that is filled with bad news. But, the, you know, the reality is if we're going to appreciate the power that good news has in our lives, that's not going to be fulfilled until we understand the bad news. Now, no one gets excited over a solution to a problem that is not a reality in their lives. This morning we're going to take some time, and I know you've come to church, and we, uh, I like to encourage you, and I like to encourage you in your walk, but we're going to take some time this morning, and for a little while we're going to talk about the bad news. We're going to spend some time talking about the bad news. The truth is the good news is forgiveness. The bad news is sin. Sin is the problem. You see, here's the problem with sin. Sin is one of those things, friend, it will destroy your life. Now, one of the things that we find throughout the Gospels is where Jesus often would make statements. And uh, sometimes when you're reading your Bible and Jesus, you know, they're in the middle of a discussion and Jesus makes a statement, you think, well, that doesn't make any sense. Have you ever been talking with somebody and they start talking about something else other than what you're talking about? I'm kind of sure in these instances, the disciples had to stop and kind of look at Jesus for a minute and go, did you not just hear what he said? Because sometimes he'll put a phrase in there and you think, where in the world did he come up with that? Well, Luke chapter 5 is one of those instances I love reading through the Gospels and finding those because what you'll find is that the disciples and the people are usually talking about earthly things and Jesus is talking about heavenly things. He's talking about godly things. Luke chapter 5 is one of those examples. That's our text, verses 17 through 26. We find in this place Jesus 
uh, forgives and heals a paralyzed man. Look at verse 17 with me. One day Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village in Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Aren't you glad Jesus has power to heal the sick? Aren't you glad Jesus has power to heal the sick? Amen. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. But when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on a mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fella who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, Get up, take up your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them and took what he had been laying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. So here's what we have. Jesus is in a certain place. The crowds have amassed around him. These gentlemen have a friend who's been paralyzed. Their goal is to get their friend to Jesus so he can heal them. But when they get there, friend, there's not even standing room. They have packed this place out. And so one of them, I kind of have to wonder if one of them wasn't a construction man because he said, you know, I think we can climb up on the roof and if we take off some of the tiles on the roof, then we can lower Jesus down into the front. Now, I don't know if I'd, if I'd been part of that group, I'd have said, buddy, you're going to get us killed today tearing somebody's roof up. But they were men of bold faith. And so they went up, tore up the roof, and lowered him down in front. And the Bible says they lowered him down right in front of Jesus. Now, remember, the reason they're bringing him to Jesus was why? They wanted him healed. He's paralyzed. And so picture with me for a moment, you're there in the crowd and there's the big hole in the roof and all of a sudden they start lowering this man down on the mat right in front of Jesus. And uh, Jesus' first words was, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't imagine his friends were probably like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. You got this wrong. That was the guy before. He needed forgiven. Our buddy just needs healed. This is, this is not a sin problem. This is a healing problem, Jesus. I know you've had a long day and probably somebody gave the wrong information. This guy doesn't need sin forgiven. This guy just needs to be healed. But the truth is what we don't understand is that sickness and sin are closely related. It has been said that sin is at the root and the very core of every human problem. Sin is behind everything that is wrong in our world today. The problems we face in Washington and around the world globally today is a sin problem. The problems we're facing in Indiana and in Grant County are a result of sin. The truth is that sin is behind every problem of substance in the universe. Sin is even the part of the problem of the earth, the planet that we live on. You see, when the curse of sin became a part of man's existence, it also became a part of the planet's existence. Global warming is not the issue. Sin is the issue. The crazy weather the changes in the earth and around the earth are all a part of a sin problem. Why? Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 and 21, for all creation is eagerly waiting for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against, notice this, against its will, all creation 
was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Earthquakes, famines, drought, violent storms, on and on and on the list can go, friend, are a result of the curse of sin that's been laid upon the earth. The Bible says the earth groans to be lifted and to be released from the curse that was placed on it. Not, a, not only is the planet problem related to sin, but every human problem is related to sin. Every sickness, every struggle that we have, every tragedy, every disease is because of sin. Every cancer, every heart problem, every debilitating disease is because of sin. You see, this was not God's original plan nor his destiny for mankind. You remember back in the account of creation in the uh, book of Genesis when God was creating, and you could read later through that account, but it, he would finish a day, and the Bible said he would create this, and then God would step back and look at it and say, it is good. Everything God did on the earth and everything God did in the human body was good. But when sin entered the picture, a cataclysmic event took place, and the planet nor mankind has been the same since. The sin brought to the planet, and the sin brought to mankind the power of death and decay. Now, this not only touches our physical bodies, but it also touches our soul. Every act of greed, every act of selfishness is because of sin at our core. Every time we break God's law, every time somebody is violated or wounded at the hand of another person, every action that elevates self and demoralizes another is because of a sin problem in the soul. Crimes against women, crimes against children, the reason that we have to have policemen on the streets, the reason we have jails and prisons, we want to blame it solely on the environment that people grew up in. But the truth is, it's a sin problem. The sin is what's created the environment that people have grown up in. Sin is the problem in the environment. Sin is the reason why we have things that are happening around us. Prideful egos, the quest for power, selfishness, sexual sin, the perversion that runs through our culture. And the truth is, friend, the Bible says these things are only going to get worse. Second Timothy chapter 3 says that evil men will go from bad to worse. So, friend, as time goes, don't be looking for things to get better. The Bible says it's going to continue to increase. You see, why does that happen? Because sin is the problem. If we don't identify the problem, we'll never find the cure. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. He didn't say, I forgive your hang-ups. He said, I don't, he said, you know, I, I'm forgiving your uh, bad choices. He, he didn't say, I'm forgiving your bad habits that you've got. He said, son, the problem is in your sin and your sin is forgiven. Romans 5 and verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people. Notice this, because all sinned. We're all born sinners. We're all plagued with a sinful nature. We are sinful by nature, sinful by action. It comes to us naturally. If you've ever noticed, no parent teaches their child to be selfish. No parent ever teaches a child to demand its own way, to lie, to cheat, to steal. Why? It's in our inner man. You don't have to teach them to have a bad attitude. You just leave them to themselves a little while and it'll come out. In fact, it's not just the children. If you leave us for a little while alone, we'll have bad attitude. Anybody in this room ever got on the wrong side of the bed? We got up and it's like, good Lord, where did that come from? Man, it's not very far underneath the surface. It's because we're born sinners. Now, when you look at, we all know the Ten Commandments. And in Exodus chapter 20, it tells us about the Ten Commandments. And you'll find in those Ten Commandments that God sets forth his law. We are lawbreakers by nature. 
So God had to put a law in place because without it, sin would have continued on its way in the lives of his creation. And you know, when you look at the Ten Commandments, you'll find, first of all, it says, you shall have no other gods before me. What does that mean? Nothing more important than God in your life at any time, any place, any situation. Not a possession, not a person, not a personal aspiration. Nothing in our life more important than God. Anybody ever struggle with that? I know I do. There's plenty of times priorities of life seem to kind of get out of control a little bit. And you're like, man, life, how did I end up here doing this and being this way? Nothing more important than God. Number two, it says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God in every area of your life. In every action and in every way, we should never do anything that misuses the name of the Lord our God. We should never dishonor God in our actions. We should never dishonor God in our ways and in our words and in our thinking. Next, he goes on to say, honor your father and mother. Don't do anything that would dishonor your mother or your father. Nothing in your actions, nothing in your words. Always honoring your father and mother, honoring them always, because otherwise it is sin. Now, we get the idea that has to do with our kids, and once we reach adulthood, that that really doesn't apply. But you know what? In the first service, my mom was still sitting in this room. I'm almost 50 years old, and my mom sitting in this room, and still the Ten Commandments apply to my life, even when I'm 50 years old, that I am to honor my mother and never dishonor her. And for me to do so, how many of you know, for me to do so is against the law of God. God's law still applies. Next he goes on, he says, you shall not murder. Now the truth is, we all probably feel pretty good about that one. We've had people we wanted to murder before. But most likely, we've not murdered them. (laughs) But the reality of the word is, in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15, he says, if anyone hates his brother or sister, he is a murderer. Why? Why is that the case? Because sin is at the root. Sin is the core, and sin is the cause. Because murder begins with hatred, And eventually gets acted out. You shall not commit adultery. Again, we probably feel pretty good about that one. But Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 28, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I'd say there's probably a lot more adultery than what we know. It's getting quiet in the house today. Next, he goes on, he says, don't steal. He says, don't lie about anything at any time or any place. To lie is sin. Don't covet. Don't desire what isn't yours. Don't don't wish you had your neighbor's house. Don't wish you had his car. Don't wish you had his wife or his money or his things. Don't covet anything. Now, the truth is that's just ten things. Those were things that God said, I don't want you to go here. I don't want you to indulge in sin in these areas. I heard someone some time back say that we are determined sinners. Very little will stop our passion for sin. Psalm 51 and verse 5 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. From birth there's nothing that we're as devoted to as sin. The truth is, you don't have to encourage anybody to sin. When you come to this church, we're not going to say to you, now now you just keep on sinning. You just keep on striving. You just keep being faithful to sin, and you'll make it through what you're going through. You're never going to hear that here. What we are going to tell you, you just keep being faithful. Stay pure. Stay honorable for the Lord. Shun sin and stay away from sin every day in your life. Why do we have to encourage you in that? Because it's natural for us to want to sin first. We're constantly in this battle. Not only are we determined sinners, but we're diseased sinners. 
Sin is a spiritual disease. Genesis 6 and 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Sin has been described in this way. It's a virus of the soul. It's gangrene of the heart. It's eating away at the fabric of your being and it will continue to do so until it completely consumes you. Not only are we determined and diseased, but we're deceived. We're deceived about sin and its consequences. When we talk about it, there's there's something in us that says, you know, man, that I I know that happened to them, but that won't happen to me, surely. You know, I I understand I got this issue, but you know what? I'm I'm in control of my issue. I'm in control of my sin. Somehow we've convinced ourselves that it ain't going to be us. Several years ago, I sat across the table at lunch one day with a man who had recently been involved in adultery. And he looked across the table at me. And he said, you know, Pastor, he said, I know what I've done is wrong. He said, but Pastor, I don't understand how something's so wrong. He said, it feels so good. Listen, it's because we're deceived by sin. Sin is very deceptive. Sin will seem good for a season, but in the end, it's bitter gall. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says the human heart is the most deceitful of all things, and it's desperately wicked. Who can really know how bad it is? You can believe the lies, and you can come to the place where you think it's all going to be okay. But listen, friend, it'll never be okay where sin is involved. You're not controlling its outcome. It's controlling your outcome, and you have been deceived. Not only are we deceived, but we're desperate. That passage of Jeremiah 17 and 9 says the human heart is deceitful. And notice this, it is above all things desperately wicked. We're desperate sinners. Friend, you can't fix this one. You can't adjust or change the outcome on your own. We're in desperation. We can't control where this thing is going to take us. You can't fix it. You can't diagnose it. And you cannot rob it of its ways. We're also destined. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. Aren't you glad for the gift of God? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friend, had there been no sin, there'd be no death, no sickness, no disease. All this mess we're in, all the problem, the reason nobody can get along around the world is because sin is at the core. So we know what the problem is. We've been talking about the bad news. Let's talk now about the outcome of the bad news. What's the long-term effect? You will notice from the passage, most of you know John 3 and 16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe on him would not what? Perish, but have everlasting life. What that means is that everyone who doesn't believe on him will perish. Now, when Jesus is talking about perishing, what does he mean? It means eternity separated from God. What does that mean? It means eternity forever, never ending in a place called hell. Eternity with the wages or the payment of sin. Hell is eternal conscious torment. Hell is the place of God's wrath and judgment for sin, and that will never end. Hell is a place where the fire never ceases, the torment never stops, and the darkness, my friend, never goes away. Well, what's the danger with that? Everybody thinks, well, I understand that truth, preacher, but I've got time to prepare in my life. I'm not, how many of y'all are planning on not dying today? Some of y'all, we're going to be visiting your funerals this week. Everybody else, I'm raising two hands. I'm kind of liking this living thing. I think I'll just keep doing it for a little while. But the truth is, 
We can say, you know what, I plan on living to a ripe old age. Well, some of our ripe old age may be 45. It may be 60. It may be 70. It may be 80 or 90. The truth is, you're not promised, friend, tomorrow. In fact, you're not even promised the end of this service. In fact, you're not even promised the next heartbeat. I've seen so many times over the years while I've been involved in ministry, people going through a normal day and didn't make it to the end of the day. We've had people be in church on Sunday, worshiping with us and praising the Lord with us, and the next Sunday, they're in heaven. Now, they wanted to go to heaven, but they weren't planning on going to heaven then. Listen, friend, you and I never know what tomorrow will bring. People die every day, every single day, and they're not planning for it. That's the danger in that truth. People say, well, you know what? I'll get it all together. Surely, I, since I'm going in church, everything will just kind of turn out okay. But friend, Jesus said there's going to be those on that day that are going to stand before him and they're going to say, Lord, look at all the things we did. We went to church and we, we did all these wonderful things. And he's going to look at them and say, I do not know you. Friend, the outcome is perishing, Jesus said, and perishing in sin. Okay, we've talked about the bad news. We've talked about the outcome of the bad news. How many of y'all ready for some good news? Say Amen. So what's the cure? This is where the wonder of forgiveness. I'm not talking just about forgive. I'm talking about the awe and the wonder of forgiveness. You see, the cure for sin is forgiveness. Said Chronicles 7 and 14. He said, I will forgive their sin. Forgive our sin. Forgiveness for everything we've ever done. Forgiveness for every sin we've ever committed. Psalm 86 and verse 5. Oh, Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive. I love that passage. I want some of y'all, I felt impressed today that this passage, as I was reading through it, I get up on Sunday morning early and I'll read through my notes, and I came across this passage, and I felt in spite of my heart, that passage is for somebody today. That passage says, Lord, you are good and so ready to forgive. A lot of times we say, you know what? I've done so many things. He's not putting up with me anymore. I've done so many things. He's forgiven me so many times, and he's probably tired of messing with me. But the Bible says, friend, he is so ready to forgive. He is full of unfailing love for all who will ask for his help. I mean, he's ready to forgive. It's kind of like I get the picture. We're, you know, dealing with this thing, and God's saying, why don't you just ask for forgiveness? And, and we're like saying, well, i got to work it out, and I've got to solve it, and I've got to become better. And it's like he's standing on the threshold of heaven and saying, won't you just for, ask me to forgive you, and I'll do it. But you don't know what I've done, Lord. You know, I'm not near as bad as, as they are, but, but still I'm bad, and and, you know, Lord, I've done all these things. I've asked you so many times. And it's like he's like, will you just ask me? But oh, I feel bad to ask because you've always been so merciful and gracious. And, and I hate to just keep asking. He's like, will you just ask me? The Bible says he is ready to forgive Friend, we're always looking at the negative side of, oh, he won't want to forgive me. The Bible says he's ready to forgive you, and he's ready to rush to your aid to those who will call for his help. That is a good word for us today. That's a good word in our heart because the truth is from time to time, old Jerry Galloway is going to need some forgiveness again and to know that I don't have to earn it or merit it or do so many steps to get it. I just need to call on him, and the Bible says he's ready to forgive me and cleanse me. Yeah. Psalm 103 and verse 12 says, He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. 
Micah 7 and 19, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all of our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Ezekiel 36 and 25, then I'll sprinkle you with, notice this, clean water on you and you will be clean. Psalm 32, 1 and 2, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven and sins are are covered. Blessed is the one who sin. The Lord doesn't count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. Woo! If those, you know what? You're to post them on the refrigerator and every day you get up, read those things. Those will encourage your heart. Those will encourage your mind and your spirit. He's a God who's quick to forgive. He's a God who's quick to separate our sin from us. Friend, your sin can be forgiven. Your sin can be paid for. He can take it all away. You can be forgiven. But friend, listen to me this morning. You can't do it yourself. This is not a change of mind. This is not about a change of behavior. Sin can only be taken away through Jesus Christ. The gospel says only Jesus can make you clean. Only Jesus Christ can forgive your sin. There is no other way. You don't need religion. You need Jesus. You don't need a change of mind. You need Jesus. You don't need a change of past. You need Jesus. You don't need a change of environment. You need Jesus. The only way for you and I to be forgiven is to receive Jesus Christ as the payment for our sin. Only you, friend, can receive him. No one else can do it for you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. I want to say that again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Believe he's the one who can forgive you. Believe he's the one who can cleanse you. The wages of sin is death. And often we focus all our attention there. But friend, you can't forget the last half. The wages sin may be death but the gift of God it's a gift it's free it's free it's a gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord whoo it's a gift how many of y'all like gifts if you don't like gifts you give me yours I like them I like gifts the gift of God it's a free gift what a oh man Think about a gift. When somebody gives you a gift, they've been thinking about it. They went and they bought it. They purchased it. They may have wrapped it up. They did all these things. They made a special presentation to you. Right here's your gift. They put a big bow on it. I mean, everything just to make it right. Listen, that's the way God does with forgiveness. Well, listen, friend, if you can't think, you often, all we can think about is how much God wants to get me. God is not out to get you. God is out to forgive you. God is out to cleanse you. And it's like God got this the big old bow on it and he says it's a gift it's free just receive it oh thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Whew. he said to the man your sins are forgiven your past Washed away. Think about that. Your past. How many of y'all got a past? If you're alive, you had a past. You got a past. In that past, there are decisions. You look back and you think, man, I wish I hadn't done that. In fact, there's things in your past probably that have brought you shame and guilt and embarrassment. Things in your past you think, I wish I had never done that. The Bible says when Jesus comes in with his forgiveness, it's as like you never had done those things. You are brand new. If any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creation, not just a remodeled creation. I'm glad God didn't just remodel me. He remade me. He made me brand new. I'm not who I used to be. I'm who he wants me to be. We're changed by the power of Jesus Christ's forgiveness. Friend, it is the wonder of forgiveness. Oh, what a wonderful blessing in our life comes through the wonder of forgiveness. 
I was challenged in the first service. And I'm going to take that same challenge this morning. And I want to close this morning. Um, I don't know that I've ever closed a service like this. The truth is, y'all got up this morning, you got ready, you came to church. You're sitting here. And the truth is, to everybody around you, you may look like everything is okay. But I don't know about you, but I've had some times in my life where I may have looked okay, but I wasn't okay. I've had some times in my life where I've said, Lord, oh God, I need mercy on that. I need mercy on that area of my life. I need mercy on that situation. Lord, I need mercy for my thoughts I've been thinking. I need mercy for my ways I've been being. Lord, I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness and your grace. Listen, friend, I don't want there to be anything in my life that doesn't bring honor and glory to Jesus. And I'll be honest with you. I'm just being as real as I know to be. There's sometimes, there's some things in Jerry that don't always honor God. I have some actions sometimes. I have some attitudes sometimes. I have thoughts and I think, Lord Jesus, where did, you ever have those thoughts you're like, where did that come from? Man, Lord, forgive me. There's times we're going to walk, listen, friends, and we're going to need forgiveness and we're going to need his mercy. And so this morning in closing, would you stand with me? This morning in closing, here's how I want to close this time. Paul, if you just come and help me. Here's how I want to do. I want us to pray a prayer all across this room, every person, every aisle, every place. And I want us, the Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked and who can know it? The truth is I don't trust my own estimation about myself. So I have to lean on him. Here's what I'd like for us to do this morning. If you would join me and lift your hands towards heaven. And let's just pray a prayer together. And you pray it in your own way, in your own words. Lord, just cleanse me of anything. Cleanse me of everything. Purify my heart and my mind. Lord Jesus, right now, just begin to cleanse us, Lord. I need your cleansing power. I need your cleansing in my mind. I need your cleansing in my heart. I need your cleansing, God, in my actions. I need your cleansing in my thoughts. God, wash me today, as the word says, with clean water that I might be clean. Lord, I don't want there to be any part dark in my life. I don't want there to be any part of sin that's tucked away back in the deep recesses of my life. Lord, would you cleanse me from all sin? Would you wash us today? Would you make us clean? Wash us, Lord, on the inside. Wash us, Lord on the outside Lord would you purify our hearts and would you purify our minds oh Lord purify us purify us purify us Lord wash us I pray wash us Lord we don't want anything to be in us that doesn't honor you cleanse us God of everything in us God that's not honoring you Cleanse us of everything, Lord, that's not bringing glory and praise to you. Lord, let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Wash us, I pray. Wash us. Lord, today we don't trust our own estimation of ourselves or our own evaluation. Holy Spirit, would you come right now? Holy Spirit, if there's some things in us that aren't pleasing to the Father, Holy Spirit, would you put your finger on it right now in our hearts? Holy Spirit, just bring it to our mind and our, rep our, our remembrance right now. Holy Spirit, just speak to us right now in this place, in this moment. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just move up and down every aisle, every row, every seat. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, would you just talk to us for a moment? Test us, O oh Lord, and try us. See if there is any wicked way in us. And Lord, would you cleanse us? Cleanse us and wash us, O oh God. Cleanse us and wash us that we might be a holy people set apart for you, O oh God, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. I believe there's a cleansing and forgiving work but now I want to take us to our second area of prayer how many know we live in a sinful and a wicked world friend there's sin all around us everywhere 
I don't only want to be clean, I want to stay clean. I need God's help. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. You know what a guide does? A guide will say, nope, don't go that way, go this way. I want the Holy Spirit in my life to tell me, you need to take a right turn here, buddy. Don't you dare go down that road. I want the Holy Spirit's help. So we're going to close now. We're going to pray, Holy Spirit, just help us. Guide us to keep us. The Bible says, now unto him who's able to keep you from falling. He can keep us from sin, friends. He can guide us down the right path. That's his desire that none of us would perish. Would you pray with me right now? Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit will just guide us. Lord, tomorrow, we don't know what tomorrow is, but you're already there because you have tomorrow in your hand. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us every day. I pray the Holy Spirit will keep us every day. Lord, we don't want to be just made pure. We want to live pure. Lord, we don't want to be made free. We want to live free. We don't want to just be made clean. We want to live clean. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray you'll help us every day, Lord, to live our lives clean for you, to live our lives pure for you, to live our lives as a holy example before you. Help us, Lord, to stay free from sin. Lord, your word says if we'll resist the devil, he'll flee from us. Lord, help us to resist. Help us to stand strong. Help us to fight the good fight of faith. Help us, oh God, to stand firm. Stand firm, I pray. Lord, help us to stay from sin. God, would you guide our paths and direct our paths. Holy Spirit, would you be there? Holy Spirit, we need you to be there as a witness to us, to tell us the things we need to turn our head from, and the things we need to shut off in our minds, the places we need not to be because of what they might lead us to. So, Lord, I pray you'll just help us. Lord, the Bible says you've given us everything we need for living a godly life in this world. And I believe you're going to give it to each person today as they're praying this prayer. I believe you hear these people pray. And I believe you're doing it already. Oh, God, I'm so thankful today for your grace. I'm so thankful at the wonder of your forgiveness. My heart is humbled. God, that knowing us the way you do know us, that you still would forgive us and cleanse us. And that you would help us to walk this path of life. Father, I thank you for all these things. And I thank you that you're going to help us tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. I thank you that you're always with us. Father, I love you. And I pray today your blessing upon these men and women. God, these are your sons and daughters. And I know you must be proud of them today. I pray, Father, your best blessing on them. God, I pray that you will pour good things into their lives. God, I pray that you'll be strength to them when they feel weak. You'll be comfort to them when they feel lonely. You'll be a strong tower when they face trouble. Everything they need you will be. I believe that. I speak over their life that you are more than enough for them. I speak over their life that our God will do exceeding abundantly above all they will ask or even imagine. I speak over them that greater is he that is in them than he that is in the world. I speak over them that no weapon formed against them will prosper. But all those who rise up against them in judgment, they will condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. I pray, Father, right now and speak peace over them. Peace that passes all understanding. For you will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Father, I thank you for all your good things. And I pray, Father, your choicest riches would be poured out upon their life. 
And I thank you and trust you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said together, amen, amen. So be it in the name of the Lord. Friends, I encourage you, walk like forgiven people. God bless you. Have a great day. May the joy of the Lord today be your strength. God bless you.